Because future-looking statements are inherently subject to risk and uncertainty, our reminder is that you should make any purchasing decisions or investment decisions based on products that are currently commercially available. Hi everyone, let's talk about APIs. Salesforce has always taken an API-first approach when building its products, which has resulted in a huge API landscape. Even though these APIs are well-documented and feature-rich, the experience that you as a developer have when using them clearly needs improvement. My name is Aditya, a developer advocate at Salesforce, and I'm here to show you the future of developer experience when using Salesforce APIs. I'm also going to show you a few features which are going to significantly reduce the time that you spend when interacting with these APIs. Let's get started. At a very high level, you can group all the Salesforce APIs into these families over here. You have the SOAP API, REST API, Bulk API, and so on. And we're always working on continuously enhancing these APIs. This year, we rolled out a few updates like usage-based entitlements for API requests, improved bulk limits, and also launched new APIs like the Composite Graph API. But as a developer, how do I interact with these APIs? First, I explore them, which means I look at how the request is framed, what parameters it accepts, and then I run it against my org to see what the result looks like. Once I've completed exploring the APIs, I'm going to integrate them with my business processes. And in some cases, write a bunch of code to send the request, parse the response, handle errors, and so on. Today, we're going to look at the future of both of these aspects, the future of API exploration and the future of API integration. Before jumping into exploring the APIs, let's look at the app against which we are going to run these APIs. We're, go we're going to be working with eBikes, which is an app from our sample gallery. It's a simple app used by electric bike resellers to manage their orders. Here we are in the eBikes org, and we're using a custom object called products, in which we are going to store the details of the bikes. If you go into the detail page of a product, you'll see that we have created many custom fields to store information like the color of the bike, the price, material, and so on. We are using another custom object called reseller orders in order to store and manage orders. Each order is related to an account, has a status, and has one or more order line items. Now, I want to interact with this app using APIs. Today, the central place where I can find all the APIs is the developer website, but to try it out, I'll have to use a tool like the Workbench. While Workbench works fine, it has several limitations like it doesn't have any request templates, you cannot save a request and fire it against multiple orgs, and so on. The solution for that is Postman, which is a free and a pretty popular tool that specializes in API exploration. And you can use it to not just explore Salesforce APIs, but any other APIs that you want. And to make it easy for you to explore Salesforce APIs using Postman, we've created an API collection, which is a bunch of request templates for the hundreds of Salesforce APIs that we have. You can download this collection today from the Postman marketplace, which is also called the API network. Today, we're going to see how this collection simplifies API exploration. Here I am in Postman where I've imported the collection. In the left pane, I can see all the different APIs grouped into folders. The latest addition to this collection is the CPQ APIs. To get started with this collection, you'll first create an environment. Click the gear icon to manage environments. You create one environment for each org that you're going to work with. And the details of the org, like the domain name, username, password, go into environment variables. You can switch between multiple environments to execute your request against different orgs. Once you've created the environment, you're going to log in. This collection lets you try out different login flows, something that Workbench doesn't allow you to do. Let's go with SOAP login as it's the easiest one. And remember, depending on the login type, make sure you populate the relevant environment variables. For SOAP login, you just need the username and password. Click send to login. Once the login is successful, we're going to store the session ID in an environment variable and automatically add it to the header of every subsequent request. Let's now explore some APIs. 
Let's start with the query endpoint. Once you select the query endpoint, you'll see that the template populates a default request. It also populates the header information and notice how the session ID is being picked up from the environment variables. Let me fire a simple query that gets a list of products from the eBikes org. Once I send the request, you can see that it returns the results as expected and includes the name field that we have just queried. Now, what if I want to query all the custom fields and not just the name field? Instead of specifying each and every field manually in the query, starting Spring 21, I can use the new fields function. You just need to write select fields of all that denotes all the fields from a given object name. Now I send the request and you can see that the result includes all the fields, both standard and custom. Next, let's explore the new Composite Graph API, which is generally available starting Winter 21. The Composite Graph API allows you to make a large number of CRUD operations on related S objects. Again, what you'll notice here is that once I click the template, a default request is populated. And a typical request is framed this way. It has one or more graphs, and each graph has one or more composite sub-requests. So let's say I want to insert some accounts, reseller orders related to those accounts, and order line items related to those orders, all in one shot. This is how the request will be framed. The first graph has all the details related to the Trailblazers account. And the first sub-request within this graph actually inserts the account. Here, I'm using a reference ID so that I can relate this account to multiple objects. The second sub-request is going to insert the order. See how I'm using the reference ID that I just created to relate this order to the account. In a similar way, I can add multiple other sub-requests for all the other orders and order line items related to the Trailblazers account. The second graph deals with all the records for another account called Universal Containers. The way we've designed the graph API is that if one sub-request within a graph fails, we're going to roll back the entire graph so that you don't have to deal with incomplete records. Now let's hit send. And once you get the response back, you can see that you can check the status of each and every individual sub-request. If all the sub-requests are successful, then the graph is marked as successful. But in the case of the second graph, you'll notice that the first sub-request has failed. which is why none of the other sub-requests have been executed and the entire second graph has been marked as unsuccessful. Now, if I want to test if this request runs correctly against any other org, all I need to do is change the drop-down above. Easy, right? If you're already using this collection, let us know your experience using the chat window. If not, use it now and let us know what you think. We are also in the process of giving you some parts of this experience directly on the developer website, but that's a discussion for next year. And this concludes the first part, which is the future of API exploration. Now let's move on to the second part, which is the future of API integration. Once you've understood the APIs, you might have to write some code to integrate these APIs into external apps. But wouldn't it be awesome if this code can be auto-generated? For that, the APIs need to be documented in a system understandable format, which is what we call a specification. The industry standard for REST API specifications is OpenAPI, previously known as Swagger. So you know we aren't the only ones renaming our products. The latest version of OpenAPI is 3.0. The other specification format we have for REST is RAML that we internally use to auto-generate code for wire adapters based on API specification. So the wire adapters you have for UI API are not written by hand. And finally, the specification format for SOAP is WSD. You can both generate and consume these API specifications in Salesforce, and this table kind of summarizes what you can do today. When it comes to WSDL, you can import an external WSDL file and Salesforce auto-generates Apex classes based on it. 
You can also generate enterprise and partner visual files for your Salesforce org. And these two features have been around for quite some time. It's nothing new. When it comes to open API specifications, you can import a spec using external services that auto generates invocable actions. Currently, you can only import open API version two spec and the ability to import an open API version three spec is in pilot. When it comes to producing open API specification for Salesforce APIs, you notice that we have a few specs for Einstein APIs, but nothing really for the core platform, which is why we have piloted the ability to generate open API version three spec for Salesforce rest APIs. We started this journey in winter 21 by creating a standard specification for the S objects rest API. And in spring 21, we are enhancing it by giving you an endpoint that generates a specification that reflects your org's customizations. You can then use this spec to auto generate code stubs for your external apps. To demo this, we're going to be extending the eBikes app on Salesforce with a public facing auto tracking app built using Node.js and LWC OSS. I've already built the UI for this. You just need to enter the order ID and hit the track button. And it's going to show you the order status, which right now is a dummy value. Let's look at the code behind this. The onclick handler for the button invokes a local endpoint. And this endpoint is exposed using Node.js. And it returns a hard-coded message that you've just seen. Now, I want to integrate this app with Salesforce so that I can fetch the order status from there. There are many ways to do this, but I'll go with the open API specification approach because it's the fastest. Back in Postman, I'm going to use the new open API spec generation endpoint. Since it's not a part of a collection, I'm going to manually add the authorization header. And once I hit send, it's going to come back to me with a specification. It includes some basic details about the API, the base URL for all the endpoints, the authentication mechanisms it supports, and a list of paths, where each path corresponds to an endpoint in the S objects REST API. There are different paths for different objects in the org. And as I mentioned, it's going to reflect your org's customizations, which is why you'll see a dedicated endpoint for the product's custom object. Let me save this response as a file. Now I'm going to use Swagger code gen, which is one of the many tools available to create code stubs based on a specification. It's a simple jar file that I can invoke using command line. And it takes in three arguments, the source of the specification file, the source of the output directory and the language. It's going to take some time to run, but once it's done, the output directory is going to contain a bunch of code stubs and a readme file. The readme file is going to have instructions on how you can use these code stubs. Along with the boilerplate code, it's also going to include a list of JavaScript methods it has created, one for each endpoint in the specification. Now I'm going to follow these steps in my project. So back in my LWC OSS project, I'm going to first import these code stubs using the command npm install. Once the installation is successful, I'm going to add the boilerplate code to initialize these APIs, which I've just copy pasted from the readme file. And finally, I'm going to replace the hard coded message with a call to a function that corresponds to an endpoint that is responsible for getting the order details based on the order ID. Let's go back to the app and fire the request one more time. You can now see that the status is coming from Salesforce. How long did that take me? Less than 10 minutes, right? And that's how easy it is to integrate apps using the new specification. So what's on the roadmap for this awesome new feature? Once our work with the S objects REST API is done, we're going to move on with the other APIs in the REST API family. And this concludes the second part, which is the future of API integration. So where to go from here? If you'd like to be a part of the pilot for the new open API specification, please raise a case with us or get in touch with your account team. Your feedback is really important to us so that we can improve your developer experience. 
Also, before Summer 21 comes out, don't forget to transition your legacy external services to use the enhanced external services. And also make sure all your integrations are updated to use the API version greater than 20. With that, I'd like to say thank you for your time and have a great rest of the conference. Financial Force accelerates growth with modern, customer-centric ERP and services automation solutions on Salesforce. Eliminate process gaps between your front and back office, reducing backlog and revenue leakage. Leverage actionable data for greater innovation and profitability. And rapidly adopt mixed revenue models to meet new customer demands. Check out Financial Force on App Exchange to learn more. Did you know most of the time we all have positive intent, but sometimes it's the impact of our actions and words that can do harm to others? We all make mistakes, but we can commit to remembering it's the impact, not the intent that matters. Skilling up on equality makes us a stronger community. Learn more on Trailhead and earn the Inclusive Marketing Practices Badge.